talk about this problem child. Phil Aldercio, Milwaukee Phil. He was born in 1912. He died September 25, 1971. He was an enforcer, hitman, all around bad guy for the outfit. He served as an underboss under Gene Conda for a very short period in the 60s. He was arrested a total of 36 times since 1926. Now that, to be clear, is under his own name. So God knows how many other times he's arrested. The charges ran from assault, battery, bombing. Who gets arrested for bombing? Racketeering, loan sharking, illegal gambling, hijacking, narcotics, counterfeiting, boy, bootlegging, bribery, extortion, and of course, murder for hire. He was an all-around guy. So Aldericio began his criminal career in his teens. He worked within the Capone organization. He was a gopher, messenger, that sort of thing. And then eventually his cousin, cockeyed Lou Frato, brought him in full-time to the operations in his 30, in the 1930s. He went to work first for Sam Giancata, for Sam Pataglia, Marshall Carafano, both of the 42 gang. And he, they were making their way up the organization quickly under Frank Nitti. Also working that, with them was a very young Sam Giancana. By the 1940s, Aldericio was working for Jake Guzik, the mob payoff and bribery guy. By the 1950s, uh, Guzik, by the way, was also sort of a bookkeeper. Um, he came from the levee, as they called it in Chicago, the red light district. He and his brother grew up there, virtual orphans. Um, there was a study of the characters in the levee in around 1900, 1800. And just by chance, the Guziks were the centers of those two studies. Isn't that interesting? So in the 50s, Aldericio and Charlie Nicoletti were the mob's killers of choice. In one incident in the 60s, uh, <laughs> they were both arrested. They sat in a parked car in what later uh, police would call a hitmobile because it had been modified with secret compartments to hide weapons in, uh, advanced lighting system so they could throw off a police tail. So in other words, they turn on the back lighting, it would blind the guys following them. When police pulled up, they found the two of them dressed in black, crouched under the dashboard, hiding on the floor. And the cops said, you know, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're waiting for our friend. And they said, what's his name? So we forgot his name. Uh, they were picked up, but they were released eventually without charges. For income in the 60s, he led a small but really efficient group of cat burglars who operated in the upscale neighborhoods, the Gold Coast. Uh, he also was not above robbing homes in his own neighborhood. They stole rare gems and jewelry, and they fenced them through jewelry stores and wholesalers that the syndicate controlled. During the, did you know Chicago in the 60s and the 70s was a jewel, stolen jewel center? If you had hot jewels, you can go there. They take care of it for you. During the 50s and 60s, the crew also was responsible for picking up uh, payoffs in the north side, restaurants, clubs, bookmakers, to make damn sure it went back to Gus Alex properly and in full. The Justice Department for a long time suspected that he was a, a Aldericio, was a, a major narcotics dealer because he was always going to Turkey and Sicily, that sort of area. Uh, but they were wrong. Apparently, he was just an avid traveler and an amateur photographer. Aldericio also ran a... But he was involved with narcotics. So let's not lose track of that either. There's this fallacy, this, this legend has grown up that Chicago was just above... So believe me, they weren't. They were criminals. They sold them. Aldericio also ran a series of highly successful, legitimate businesses, uh, restaurants, fine restaurants. He had a meatpacking plant, a couple of small hotels... He had nightclubs on Rush Street. He operated, on the other hand, he did operate a couple of high-priced bordellos, whorehouses, uh, striptease parlors in the, in the vice districts. Um, he also is said to have owned, it's not really clear if it's true or not, but an enormous number of shares in these huge international firms. Um, and he took these, he belonged to a stock investment club with Tis Pataglia, who also had a lot of investment in legitimate firms. During the McClellan Committee, he pled, now we're talking about Aldericio, he pled uh, the fifth 25 times in 45 minutes. Now, all that accomplished was he was now the center of attention of the Justice Department. You, you can't embarrass the Justice Department. I don't know why gangsters never really, you, you just can't do that. Let them win for the day. Because when you embarrass them, they feel like, well, now we've got to justify our pay. And they went after him. They go after all the guys who do this. And, and they indicted him. And eventually they jailed him for extortion. 
An FBI document describes a meeting in which Aldericio and his lawyer, the infamous Edward Bennett Williams, quote, reportedly informed his client, that Bennett reportedly informed his client, that he had an excellent contact within the Justice Department and felt that they could uh, get the recently appointed Supreme Court justice. They, uh, we think that you're talking about Thurgood Marshall. Uh, to play ball with them and overturn Aldericio's conviction. It didn't matter. Aldericio died from natural causes at the Penn in Marion, Illinois, on September 25, 1971.